Well, good morning. Listen, you guys need to come to my church and do that every time. I, this is great. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, really excited um, to be with you and honored to be here with CLF and um, just so appreciate this ministry. And I, I so appreciate the fellowship for us. You know, when, you, when you're in ministry, it's, uh, it's lonely at times, but it's always good to know that you have somebody who, uh, who feels your pain, right? Amen. <laughs> who feels what you're going through. And so We've, we have journeyed um, over the last, you know, couple of years, a very, very interesting journey, all of us together. But before I get into that, I just share a little bit. My wife and I, we do pastor in, uh, in Denver, but west of Denver is Arvada. On, our, on your way to the mountains to go skiing, you're going you're gonna to drive by very close to our, uh, to our church. We have, a, we have a school as well, a K through 12 school. Uh, actually, if you're on I-70, you can see our campus right off I-70. You can see our football field. And, but we just, we, we just believe in, in what God's, God has called us to be, to be people who impact culture. That is what we're called to do. Um, and so God's called us to, to serve and to pastor this church that so we're very honored to do it. We've been on staff at the church now, I think, collectively for 12 years. And so I've been on staff at this. It's, it's actually a church I'm pastoring. is my, my wife's home church. She grew up there, um, but we met in, uh, in Bible College in San Antonio. We got married, and uh, we, were, we were serving there together, and then I went out and went on staff at her home church, and so that's why you, you got to, it matters who you marry because they could get you a job, you know, you just, it, it, really, it really matters. Um, so, you know, we went on staff, and I was a youth pastor there um, back in 2003, and then I transitioned into the worship pastor at the church, and um, during that time, I did I traveled and did worship with Promise Keepers for uh, five years. I was a worship leader with them, so it, it's been a great journey. And then my wife and I, just since the call of God, we went to England for four years, and we were uh, ministering there in the UK. And uh, very honored to be a part of uh, a church there and serve. And the Lord spoke to us to come back, and uh, and we came back. And so we've been pastoring the church now for a little over five years, and so. We're honored to be at uh, Faith Church. We really are. So I want to share with you some things today um, that are going to be very challenging. And as ministers, we, we, it's, it's good for us to, to be challenged. And it's good for us to, to evaluate things in our own life and in our own heart, in our own churches, in our own ministries. And so today I, 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 I am talking the, the, a little bit about the call of God. But as I was preparing, I sensed that God wanted, wanted to to speak to us in a very unique way. And so I, I, I titled this message, a letter to your church or to your ministry or whatever it may be, but a letter to you. And so here's a question for us today. If Jesus wrote you a letter, wrote a letter to your church, what would it say? What would it say about how, how you're doing? How would he encourage you? How would he um, challenge you? How would he um, speak to you? And so today I, I, I want to come from this aspect of the letter to your church of, of what he would, does he have any complaints about our churches? What areas would he challenge? And so, I, I, and so I, I, we're going to step into this from, from, from the, the book of Revelation and hear what God has to say to us today. And so all of us, before I get into this, the reality is this, all of us has been, have been challenged in ways that we've never been challenged before through COVID. We have endured all kinds of issues. We've endured all kinds of um, concerns. We've, we've endured moments of doubt. We've endured moments of faith. We've endured um, walking with our people into funerals. We've, we've endured trying to get to hospitals, but we can't go and see our people We've endured serving our people who are at loss. We've endured also a spiritual battle that, that, was un, that is unleashed on our, on our world. And so we've endured a lot. And, I, and when you endure things like that, when we go through these types of things, I believe it's always an opportunity for the Lord to speak to us, to actually evaluate what's going on in our own lives. And so um, for all of us today... If Jesus was to write us a letter about our ministry and about what we've been through and about what we're doing, what would it say? And so I, I, wanna, I want us to read from the book of Revelations. 
And we're beginning this passage out of Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. And so this is a letter to the church in Ephesus, but, but we're, we're going to find ourselves in this letter. You, you're going to find yourself in this letter. And so scripture says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars. This is a word spoken to the seven pastors of these seven churches in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. And this is the seven churches. You have a seven pastors and seven churches. I know your deeds. Remember, this is from Jesus, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not. You have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But if you have this in your favor, you hate the practices, which you have this in your favor, you hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And, and almost all of these letters that are written to the church. Remember, remember, this is in Revelation. So we have, in the beginning, we have Genesis. We have the fall of man. We, have, we, we see sin. We see the need for the church. We have the journey of what God did through the Old Testament to bring forth Christ. We have Christ's coming. We have his death, burial, resurrection. We have the day of Pentecost. We have the, the, the early church being birthed and exploded. We have the church being planted around the world. And so we have the beginning of Genesis. And this is... The finish line, the finish line of the church, of what we're called to do as the church. And Jesus writes a letter to the church in Ephesus and he writes him and, and there's a, there's a compliment, there's a critique and there's a challenge. And I, as we lean into this, it's important for us to understand one, we, when we get a letter like this, we, we know this. We think, man, these are the churches in Ephesus. These are the churches that, that the apostle, God used the apostle John to write to. And here, here's what I love about this. The fact that this church in Ephesus got this letter gives me hope and gives me encouragement and helps me know that there's no such thing as a perfect church, right? There's no such thing as a perfect church. I mean, this, this is the, the, the apostle John, this is during this time. And, and the Lord is, is speaking to them. They, they had been through a lot in this church. And so for us, we need to know this, that there is no such thing as the perfect church. And we get discouraged as we, as we lead in ministry. We get discouraged because I'll, I'll tell you this. We get online and we look at what everyone else is doing. And we say this, oh, I'm not doing that. Oh, what are they doing? Oh, I, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not able to do all of that. But here's, here's the reality. And this is something we all need to understand. You can have as big of a ministry as you want as you're willing to pay a web designer to actually position your, your ministry online to look as big as you want it to look. When you see things online, you, we don't know the full story. And so we compare and we try to, we lean, we, we try to see, hey, what's going on? But the fact is this, God's, God has called us uniquely to lead the ministry that we're leading. He's called us uniquely to be in the ministry that we are in. And so the letter to the church in Ephesus is a letter to us. And I want you to receive some encouragement today. So if Jesus was to write you a letter, if Jesus was to write me a letter, what would it say? How, how, how would Jesus speak to us today? And so we, we begin by looking at this encouragement from Jesus, from this scripture, the believers in Ephesus, the believers in Ephesus, excuse me, I didn't forward that along, but the believers in Ephesus would meet in large outdoor areas. They'd meet house to house. And Jesus began the church in the book of Acts, and it has moved now into Ephesus. And so the city of Ephesus was a very significant city. It was like New York City. It was like L.A. It was like London. But in Ephesus, there was a problem. 
There was a problem that was going on. It was the center of a pagan religion, a, a religion of fertility. It was a religion that basically worshipped sexual reproduction. The culture would pray and make offerings to Artemis or Diana, the god of fertility, for their women to be fertile, for their crops in the field to grow, for their livestock to, to, to bring forth more, more livestock. There was a perverse sexual statue in the center of the city. So this is where the church is. Listen, you, th- you think where your church is bad, this place is bad. And this is where the church was. There was this, the, a statue in the middle of the city. And it was a huge statue. It was sensual. It was sexual. And it was sex that was worshipped. And there was this temple. It was a brothel. The temple to Artemis was a brothel. And everything about the culture was turned to worship a demonic sex god. And offer there their own bodies as sacrifice. So there is a lot of similarities, one, to the culture we live in as what's going on in Ephesus as well. But this is the setting of the church. This is, this is the setting of where this church in Ephesus actually is at. And Jesus is proud of them. And Jesus is in the midst of this, is, is encouraging them in the midst of this cultural pressure of this overwhelming sexualized society. Being different in that society was a very difficult thing to do. And so there was a pressure to pull back. There was a pressure to give up. There was a pressure to compromise. There was a pressure to, to, to speak like the culture speaking. There was a pressure to, 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 to give up. There was a pressure to, to listen to culture. Culture, you tell me what I'm supposed to do. There was a pressure to, to be timid. There was a pressure to not stand on the word of God. There was a pressure to look and act and talk and use all the right pronouns. There was all of that. The pressure was here. The pressure was here, just like us. And so Jesus encourages them. And I I want you to receive some encouragement today. He says this, number one, he tells them, you have remained faithful to the purpose of the church. Friends, listen, the church of Jesus Christ has a purpose. it's, It's not a building. It's not a it's not a social club. It's not a, hey, let's go and hang out. It's, it's, it's not, we're not building our kingdom as, as ministry leaders. We're building his kingdom. The church belongs to Jesus. I, I, we must understand that. The church doesn't belong to you as a pastor. You are an under shepherd to the chief shepherd. You're an under shepherd to the chief shepherd. And so Jesus tells this church, you remain faithful to the purpose. Jesus said to them, he he says this, he says this, I know your deed, your hard work and your perseverance. Friends, over the last two to three years, it's been hard work and we've had to persevere. It it just has. It's been hard work to, to deal with all the issues that's going on in society and culture, the pressure of it. It's been hard work to persevere when you felt discouraged, when you felt like giving up, when you thought, man, really, is this really what, what's happening? Is this, how, how am I going to keep going? How am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to feed my family? This church persevered in difficult times. And Jesus is saying, I'm proud of you. That you've been working hard. You've been a light in your workplace. You've kept the purpose of the church at the center. You are faithful to meet and to gather. You've studied my word. You've been my witnesses. You've remained focused. And this, Jesus is encouraging the church that they have persevered. When he says you have persevered, you worked hard and persevered, what he's talking about is the church. The church has fulfilled the purpose of the church. Because I'll tell you this, there is pressure, so much pressure to get your ministry, your, the call of God on your life, and your church To be something that Jesus never called it to be. To preach stuff that Jesus never called you to preach. The church has a function. And it gets its function from the unction of its leader, Jesus. And the word of God. And so this church in Ephesus has equipped the saints. They've been witnesses. And Jesus says this. I'm so proud of you. And listen, this is what I believe Jesus is saying to you ministry leaders 
Because the enemy is telling you, you've failed, you've, you, you're less than, you're not enough. Jesus said this, no, no, don't listen to that. He said, listen, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. You have been through so much. You have endured, you persevered, and I'm proud. You need to receive that today. The Lord's proud of you. The second thing that Jesus encourages the church and encourages you today, li- listen to what he says. He says, you have anchored your lives to truth. So this, this, this is the second encouragement Jesus gives. And this is what he says. He says, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not and have found them false. So there are some difficulties in the church in Ephesus. And here's, here's the truth about the church. I, I want you to catch this for a moment. The difficulties didn't come from the persecutions of the world, it came from bad doctrine and bad teaching from within. It came from pastors or other leaders in the church saying, hey, you better preach on this, and actually, you better do this, or you better use this scripture and apply it to this over in culture, or I'm going to cancel you, or I'm out of here. I'm going I'm I'm to I'm t- I'm cancel you, and I'm going to take these people with me. And this, and this is the reality here. These people, these people in the church, they were teaching compromise. They were, they, they were getting their cues from how a church should run from the, church, from, from the world. And so they were, they were trying to bring other people within. But the pastors remain strong. The Nicolaitans, which is Jesus' references in this letter, were teaching you need to be more open to people who are pagan. You need to embrace their way. Don't be so rigid is what they would teach. Actually, you need to do it because if you do it, now hear me today. Listen, if you do it, you won't be as persecuted. If you do what they want you to do, if you say what they want you to say, if you you fight for what the world who is demonically ruled, if, if you do what the world tells you to do, you won't have as much persecution. They won't cancel you. They won't, they, they won't put stuff on social media about you. If you put stuff on social media that they want you to. And so the Nicolaitans were saying, hey, listen, you can practice some things that they're doing. And they were teaching you, you can serve God and, and, and appease the world at the same time. That's what the Nicolaitans were doing. But you know what this church did? You know what these leaders did? They said this, no, we're not having that. We're we're, we're not having that. By the grace of God, we're not having that. And Jesus is commending the leaders that you you stood. Listen, we've been through some difficult times over the last couple of years. We've had to say, no, we're not having that. We're going to remain true to the purpose of the church. Nope, we're not going to have that. Listen, I, I received all kinds of letters over the last three years. I've been called all kinds of things over the last three years. Do you know why? Not because of what I said, because what I didn't say. Because the world was telling me, you better do this. You better do that. You you better. uh Uh-uh. No, 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 no. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We have, we have the the gospel of Jesus to preach. It's the only thing that's going to serve our world in broken, hurting times. Nothing I do of, of the flesh. Now hear me today. Nothing we do with the flesh is going to actually change anything. But by the spirit of the gospel and through the preaching of the gospel, it transforms man's hearts. And then hearts are transformed to bring forth the kingdom of God. And so this is what was happening here in the, in the church of Ephesus. And so he's commending the leaders. He's commending uh, the believers of the church for not tolerating teachings and pressures and talking points that were not in the Bible. He said, good job. It was hard. It was hard, but good job. It's been hard over the last several years. Some of us have, have been led astray by culture. Some, some of us have, have said, no, this is, this is not what God's called me to do. And, and we remain true to the scriptures and, and we tried and we weren't perfect. I promise you that. There's no perfect person in here. Let, let me promise you, if you were preaching this last year, you didn't preach perfectly. 
But by the grace of God, God used us to minister to people. And so we did our best to remain true. So many believers many times are influenced by a desire to go outside of the word of God. Because here's the truth. Humans, me included, want the newest and the greatest thing. We want the greatest experience. We want, we, we, we want to be relevant, which is a, which is a word that um, I don't really like much. But we want to be relevant. And so in their, in, their, in their human fleshy desire, we all have a desire to get something that no one else has. We have a desire to be something that no one else is. Or we have a desire to appease people around us. And there's, there's plenty of people selling you things that you should say, you should preach, you should share. So if someone is teaching something for us in our own churches, in our own ministry, we always evaluate it. But this admonishment from Jesus, he says, I know you've been anchored to the truth. I know. And he says, I'm, I'm proud of you. And I want you to hear something that the Lord is proud of you today. He's proud of you. You remain true to the scriptures. Number three, an encouragement from Jesus is uh, that he gives to the church in Ephesus. He says, you haven't allowed your emotions to derail, to derail you from your purpose. If you've ever gone on a journey and walked by faith, you will know that you've got to deal with your emotions. You, you've got to deal with, your, with the thoughts. And the call of God on your life, the call of God on your life has to be filtered, has to be, has to be evaluated. You've got to embrace it. And when you embrace it, then you've got to deal with the emotions that attack it at times. And Jesus tells this church, you haven't allowed your emotions to derail you. He said this, he says, you have persevered. And have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. This church was facing unique challenges because they refused to bow the knee to culture. They refused to bow the knee to the goddess Diana or the images they, uh, or bow the knee to the images of the emperor. And because of that, they were slandered. Now, now hear, hear me today. L listen to what this church has gone through. Because they refused, they were slandered, they were boycotted, they were abused, they were objects of physical violence, they were socially ostracized, and yet they endured. So listen, being an overcomer, what Jesus encourages them isn't about your circumstances going away. Listen, being an overcomer is a matter of your heart. And so over the last couple of years, we have had to endure. And for you to follow the call of God in your life, you've had to endure. You've had to overcome your emotions. You've had to overcome the things that you're wrestling with. You've, it, in the midst of the call of God, you, you begin your emotions and, and the, the narrative of your own mind tells you what you are and what you aren't. You can't follow God. You can't do this. You can't remain faithful. And God encourages them, you remain faithful. And this, this church did not allow their emotions and feelings to derail them from their being what, them being what God had called them to be. And so I want to encourage you today, encourage you today that you're going to have to wrestle your emotions. When you answer God's call in your life, you're going to have to deal with your emotions. You're going to have to deal with your mind. And you're going to have to submit that mind to the word of God. You're going to deal with, with pressure from culture that tells you, you can't do this you have to say this. You have to bow the knee to this person, to this God. But the reality is, is God's call. He invites us. He, do, he equips us when he calls us. When God called you, he equipped you with his grace to walk it out. This isn't about your will or your strong-headedness or your, and your, your grit. This is about the grace of God. And he called this church to be what they were called to be. And to be a church that, that proclamates the gospel. They were faithful and he encourages them to do it. So one of the signs of maturity is not just enduring hardships, but to endure hardships emotionally as well. It just doesn't mean you go through it. It means you, 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 you surrender this, this heart, these emotions to the will of God. And so this, this church, regardless of the difficult times, remained encouraged. They've remained on mission 
They've remained focused and they did not allow their emotions to derail them. They remained faithful to their call. So many of us over the last couple of years, we have, we have endured all kinds of pressure. Our emotions have been all over the place. And even when you have to deal with emotions, the, the reality is we don't follow our emotions. This church didn't follow their emotions. And so this church didn't, didn't, wasn't led by their emotions over the truth of God's word. They actually crucified that area. They actually surrendered. They actually asked God to help them. And God's encouraged it. Listen, if Jesus wrote you a letter, would he, would he, would he say, hey, nice work over the last couple of years? So in hard times like this church, it feels like God is distant. I don't know about you. Um, over the last two to three years, did, did you ever have a, a thought, God, where are you? God, what are you doing? We all did. We thought, God, are you at someone else's church and not at mine? Or so? I mean, what's, what's going on? And anytime you endure hardships, it feels like God is distant. But we know, because we know the scriptures, he's not. It feels, at times, you can't go through another day. For us, we had all kinds of pressures. We had all kinds of issues. Um, like I said, I, I, was, I was, here's, this was a new one for me. Um, I received two letters. I don't know if they were friends or what. Uh, two emails that uh, had a prayer for me to pray and cast the demonic spirit out of me because I didn't do what culture told me to do over the last three years. That hurt. It doesn't matter how many people you have in your, in your ministry. When, when your own people want to cast demons out of you, it kind of takes a little personal, right? <laughs> what in the world? We had... All kinds of stuff. False things. But we endured. We said, we're, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, we're not playing the game. We're going to preach the gospel. That's what God's called us to do. And so this church didn't allow their emotions to be derailed. So I have some questions for your church or your ministry. I want you to look at them today. Are we carrying the purpose of the church? This is a question. Jesus, in, Jesus tells the church in Ephesus, listen, you have, you, you've remained faithful to the purpose. Now, friends, what's the purpose of the church of Jesus Christ? I promise you, it's not what, it's not what the world says it is. It's not what culture tells you it should be. You, do you know who defines the church? The founder of the church. The one who, who gave his, his blood and laid his blood down for the church, the one who gave his own life for the church. Listen, I, I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody who laid their life down for the church of Jesus Christ, except for Jesus. Amen. Amen. So when you're leading in his church, you don't ask someone else what you should do. You ask the founder and the one who paid, paid the cost of your church by his own blood. What is the purpose of the church? Are, are we carrying out the purpose in our churches? By what God has called us. Second question. Are we anchored to the truth of God's word? Are we, are we guarding right doctrine? Are we correcting bad teaching? Are we correcting wrong thinking? About the purpose of the church. Listen. If you want a church that's anointed by Jesus. If you want a church that, that is provided by. That God, Jesus provides for it. Then, then we are to be a part of a ministry. And, and leading ministries. That actually look to him. For direction as we lead. Number three. The question for us is. Are we allowing our emotions. To derail us. From persevering. So many emotions today. Politics. So many things have distracted the church. Here, here's a couple. Masks, vaccines, restrictions, media. 
Talk about emotional topics. Some of us right now, hang on, relax. That's not our purpose. This, 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 is not the, I, this is not the purpose of the scriptures. The purpose of the church is to be faithful to the leader of the church, which is to honor Jesus. Honor Jesus. Honor Jesus. Don't let our emotions derail us from persevering in the purity of what God's called us to be. Here's some questions for us personally. For all of us in this room, all of us who would be watching this, am I being faithful to the purpose of the church? Am I being faithful? Am I anchored? Am I anchored personally to the truth of God's word? Or am I being led, led around by culture? Do I look to myself, the demand of culture or the world for instruction? Or do I look to God's word? Listen. Culture will change. Amen? Amen? Word of God will remain forever. Here's another question. Am I allowing my emotions to derail me from persevering? The second thing that the Lord speaks to in this passage is he gives a loving correction. There's a loving correction from Jesus. Many scholars believe that the church in Ephesus was living off of the success and the growth and the prestige of the past and their spiritual condition had become weak. It's the same for us today. When you as an individual or a church live from what was old methods, old systems, old experiences, old programs, the same thing happens. We become spiritually in a bad place and we become cold. Many times you don't realize you're in a bad place because you're stuck. Now, now, just hear me today. Many times you find yourself in a bad place because you're stuck, not looking forward, but looking to what was. You're, you're, you're trying to recreate what, what happened 10 years ago, 12 years ago, two years ago. You think, no, by golly, God did it. That way, under a tent in the middle of that field. And if we could just get back to that field. Yeah, but there's, a, there, but there's a building there now. Yes, we'll tear the building down and put a tent back up there. That's not the way things work. God is a God who breathes fresh things. And so this church was looking back. They were actually, they, they, they were actually living from the success of what happened 10 years ago. So they weren't continuing to press forward. And this is what Jesus says. He he lovingly corrects them. He just says, your love for me isn't what it used to be. It isn't what it used to be. Yes, you're doing good things. And, and th this to me, when I read this, it's, it's shocking to me. And, but he says this, yet I, ho I hold this against you. You're doing good things. You're, you, you persevered. You're, you're, not, you're not giving in to, to, to bad doctrine. But yet, I hold this against you. You've forsaken the love you had at first. I hold this against you. So the questions for us, and this is, a, this is a very direct message for us today, and for me and for all of us, have our actions become more of a priority than our relationship with Jesus? So with this church, their actions had become, this is what they were known for, their actions, what they did, and they had forgotten about the relationship. Jesus was saying, you have lost the first sense of a enthusiasm and excitement of your Christian life. You look good on the outside, but you're shallow on the inside. They were going through the motions. And so the reality is this. So as they were looking back to what, what used to work and what used to, um, what used to gave, what, what put them on the map as a ministry, they were looking to what we did then. And the truth is this, those who are going who are just going through the motions of the Christian life are often obsessed with the motions of Christian life. What I mean is this. You make the motions of it more important than your relationship with Jesus. You make your methods more important than the heartwarming connection to a living God that has called you and loves you. It says, come and follow me. 
those whose love has grown cold. Now, now listen, they confuse the message with the, mes- with the method with the message. They confuse them. They have principles, but they've lost touch with the prince. They know the Bible, but they are not demonstrating the spirit of the author of the Bible. And these are symptoms of our love drifting. What's interesting is many Christians think that the only symptom of love that is that if you're growing cold, well, it means you're sinning or you're, you know, you're, you're doing things that aren't, aren't pleasing. But according to Jesus, you can be active. According to this church, you can be active. You can be enduring. You can be busy. You can, your church can have programs. You can have prayer meetings. You can have 24 hour prayer rooms. You can, you can be doing all the right things, feeling like you're doing all the right things. You can have this group and that group. And your love for Jesus can still grow cold. This church was active. They, they, were, they were doing stuff, but their hearts had grown cold. They had confused doing with being with Jesus. They had confused doing for Jesus with being with Jesus. So they were doing the right things, but they had lost the sight of the one that they were doing it. This is something I've had to wrestle with over the last three years in the, in the explosion of adrenaline through all of our bodies and you've got to do it and do it. And, and, and sometimes you forget, actually, I'm doing this for Jesus, not for me, not for the church, not for the ministry, but for Jesus. And so if you feel like this is you, if you feel like maybe you've been, you've been doing things and forgotten the reason why, just hang tight because the Lord wants to encourage you. So why did Jesus make this point to them? And why would he challenge us today? And I'll tell you why. It's because he has not lost his passion and love for you. He has not lost his passion for this church, nor for you, for your personal life and your church. Why would Jesus correct you to make you feel bad? No, because he loves you. He's called you. His passion is for you. He believes in you. And he says, come on, let's, let's, let's use this time over the last three years to, to realign some things. And come on, let's get after it and live a life that's just the greatest life that we could live. And so, yes, Jesus wants our affection because he loves you. He misses you. He doesn't want you living from, living from close relationships that you used to have with him, that you, that you used to meet with him. He doesn't want you living from, from the intimacy you used to have and the time you used to spend. He wants to know you now because he's the God of now. He's the, he's the Savior now. He's the one who wants to heal you now. And so some questions for us today. Church questions for us. Simple question is this. I'll ask this one. Have your actions become more of a priority than your relationship with me? Have we allowed any activity? Now, this is directed to churches, but also also us. Have we allowed any activity or program to become our identity as a church instead of allowing Jesus to give us our identity? Very, very important. Churches including mine, find their identity in what they do mistakenly instead of finding it in who they do it for. Are we more proud of what we do or used to do than we are of why we do it? Do our activities exist to accomplish the great commission or do they exist to keep us busy? Do we desire to do what is on the heart of Jesus more than we desire for Jesus to do what is on our hearts? These are some cutting questions. Do people come to our church or ministry because we carry out the mission of Jesus? Or do they come because of another reason? The church I'm I'm leading, when I first started leading... I was told often, well, I come here to the church because of this or this. But do do you know what I I found? 
No one said, I come here because of the love for Jesus. People say, I come to the church because of whatever. And I'm not going to get into all the reasons they said because it's not important. People say, and I would just tell them, I would, I think the best reason to choose a church is because of their love for Jesus. So some personal questions. Has what you do for Jesus become a substitute for being with Jesus and growing with him? Does your identity come from what you do for Jesus more than who you do it for? Do you find yourself more frustrated when your will isn't done than when the will of Jesus isn't done? That's a good question. Somebody say, that's a good question, Pastor. Just tell me. Okay, good. That's a good question. (laughs) Does your attitude reflect... One who has been with Jesus. And the last is this, an invitation from Jesus to recover all that was lost. And Jesus, my first point is this. I I want you to hear this. Jesus says, remember where you were. Jesus says, consider how far you have fallen. Why would he say say that to to, to hurt you? No, no, no. No, he said, remember where you were. Hey, do, do you remember where you were, when he says, consider how far you fall. In other words, go go back to where you were. Jesus is challenging them and us to take an inventory, to evaluate where you were, where you were close with him, when you were filled with passion for him, when you were obsessed. Now hear me today with the message instead of methods. When you were obsessed with the message of Jesus instead of could be catchphrases or social followers or buildings or names or books, our version, our culture, whatever of Christianity. He says, go back to the time your relationship with me was about me. Consider how far you have fallen. Remember what it was like back then. So this is the voice of Jesus. So hear me today. The voice of Jesus inviting us back out of the pandemic, out of the issues that we walked through, inviting us back to freedom, to the excitement of the call of God, to humility, to the purity of the call of God on our lives, the purity of it. No one defines the call of God in your life except for God himself. It's no one else's call except for God himself. Not your mama's call, your daddy's call. It's not your culture's call, your uncle's call. It's the God of the Bible has called you. He's the one who defines it. And so he says, come back. Come back to me. It's not the invitation to perform. It's not come back and work harder. It's the invitation to embrace his grace fresh and new. And to bow our knees to God's call on our life and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And it's also the invitation to, we repent of our sin. We repent. You know, some, some will say, you don't have to repent of your sin once you're saved because, you know, you, 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 you are the righteousness of God. You're clothed in the righteousness of Christ when God looks at He does, absolutely. But the reality is this. Have you ever, if you're married, have you ever done something against your spouse and says, I don't have to repent. We're married. What's the matter? (laughs) Repentance just restores the heart of relationship. And so he says this, repent and do the things you did at first. In other words, let's, let's, let's restore our, our connection. Jesus is saying, listen, if you want to return to the place that I long for you to be. Now, this is Jesus inviting us. If you want to return to the place that I want you to be, the closeness, to be at peace, to be near me, to have my provision and me working in your life, then acknowledge where you've fallen short. Acknowledge that. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to to help us. Ask him to help us think differently. Ask him, just come to him. We're to think differently. Renew our minds Repenting means we we change our minds from thinking that our good deeds are the same as being close to him. They are not. Daniel Atkin, he's the president of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. He says this, labor 
Now listen to this quote. Labor is no substitute for love. Purity is no substitute for passion. And deeds are no substitute for devotion. Jesus says, come here. And number three, the invitation from Jesus is return to where you once were with Jesus. Jesus says, repent. Then he says, do, do, he says, do the things you did at first. Do the things you did at first. I want you to remember the call of God. Remember when Jesus called you? Remember that moment that your heart burned within you? Remember the moment that you, you didn't ask anybody else about your purpose. You found it. It was with your creator who called you and he loves you and he, and, and somehow he would use your, your broken life and he'd use the little piece of meat between your, your two gums and your teeth to flap around. And somehow it's, it, it brings hope to a lost, broken, hurting person. Somehow God would use your hands and your feet to represent him, a holy God. And he says, that's because I love you. He says, return to that place. Return to that place of humility. Return to that place of call. Return to that place of, of passion for me. Return to the place where I was your source. Return. Do the things you used to. Return to the place where you didn't measure what God could do through your life based on your ability. And your faith was anchored with Jesus. Return to the place where you look at your circumstances and you say, man, this is impossible. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. But with God, all things are possible. With God. Return to that place. Do you remember? Now, just real quick, and I'll close with this. Do you remember when you, the original relationship with God years ago? You were intentional. You were aware of his presence. You were continually having conversation. Listen, there were times in, my, in, in our ministry that I'm busy and I'm like, man, what are we going to do? And I, and I just hear a little voice. The Lord says, well, when are you going to ask me? When are you going to talk to me about it? I think, yes, you are right. But do you remember when you were aware of his presence? Remember when being with Jesus was so precious. It was so sweet. Remember when your heart was overflowing with appreciation for his call. Remember when you weren't worried about someone knowing your name. You just wanted to know him. He says, return to that call. Return to that place. You remember the days when you. You couldn't believe that he would forgive and cleanse you. Do, do, do you remember the moment that you said, Lord, I can't believe that you love me. Do you remember the moment that the grace of God impacted you and transformed your life? Do you remember the moment? He says, let's return to that place. That he would cleanse you and that he loves you and, and he saved you. You couldn't believe that God wanted you to be in his family. And now he wants you to help others be in, in the family. And you were overcome with love for him. And you, you just wanted to do what he wanted you to do. Nothing else matters. Jesus says, go back to those first things. Go back to those first things. Listen, ministers, go back to those first things. Go back to the first reason you said yes to the call of God. Go back to the first reason that you, that when you were humbled by the, by the grace of God, go back to that reason, go back to him. There's a, there's a story of a, of an old couple. They've been married about 60 years and they're driving. They're going on a drive on a Sunday afternoon and they're driving around and the husband's talking to his wife and he says, sweetheart, do you remember the days that you used to sit next to me? And she says, you're right. She said, I, I remember those days. So she starts talking to him and says, I can't believe that we don't do this anymore. I can't believe that, that we don't sit next to each other anymore. And 
And so he just, he's driving, and then she goes off on a long tangent. I'm not saying that wives do that, but she did, about how they're not close anymore when they drive. And as he kept driving, he just looked over, and he says, well, sweetheart, I'm not the one that's moved. And so she slid over next to him. The reality is God's not the one who has moved. We just got to slide over. He says, come on back. So for us today, let's return to doing the first things that Jesus said we should do. The first things when you were transformed by Jesus, those things. The first things when you were called into ministry, those things. He invites us to come closer. Just because, you, do you know why? He just misses you. He misses you. Let's pray. Father, we, we commit this message to you today. Lord, we, we surrender to you today. We receive your encouragement. We receive your loving instruction. And we receive the invitation to return to the original call. Your heart. Your spirit. Not to perform for you. Not to get caught up in our missing our intimacy with you because we're so busy. Lord, today, by your grace, we just say thank you for the call. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for ministering to me. And Lord, may we return to our purpose. And that's to know you and to make you known. In Jesus' name, amen.